Liddy, Chapter 9, The Weaving Room. Creation! What a noise! Clatter and clack, great shuddering, moans, groans, creaks, and rattles, the shrieks and whistles of the huge leather, leather belts on wheels. And when her brain cleared enough, Liddy saw through the murky air row upon row of machines, eerily like an old hand loom in a Quaker Stevenson's house, but as unlike a nightmare, for these creatures had come to life. They seemed, uh, they seemed moved by eyes alone, the eyes of neat, vigilant young women, needing only the occasional swift intervention of human hand to keep them clattering. From o the overarching metal frame, uh, crowning each machine, wooden harnesses, carrying hundreds of warped threads from a massive beam at the back of each loom, clanked up and down. Shuttles, holding the weft thread, hurtled themselves like beasts of prey through the tall forest and warped threads, and beaters slammed through uh, the threads tightly into place. With alarming speed, inches of finished cloth rolled up on beams at the front of the looms. The girls didn't seem afraid or even am amazed. She, or As she walked by with the overseers, girls glanced up. A few smiled, some stared. No one seemed to mind the deafening din. How could they stand it? Had or she thought a single stagecoach struggling to hold back the horses on a downhill run was unbearably noisy. A single stagecoach. A factory w or a factory was a hundred stagecoaches, all inside one skull, banging their wheels against bone. Her impulse was to turn and run out the door, down the rickety stairs, through the yard and counting room, across the narrow bridge, past the row of boarding houses, down the street, out the hellish city, and back, back, back to the green hills and the quiet pastures. But of course, she didn't move a step. She she didn't even corner her or cover her ears against the assault. She just stood quietly in front of the machine that her overseer had led her to, and pretended she could could hear what she what he was saying to her. His mouth was moving like a strange little red mouth peeping out from under his bushy black uh, mustache. The exuberant growth of the mustache was all more all the more peculiar because the overseer had hardly any hair on top of his head. His pate gleamed uh, like polished wood. He suddenly, to Liddy's astonishment, the boy or er, the man put his red mouth quite closer to her ear. She jerked her head away before she realized he was shouting these words. Is that quite clear? Liddy stared at him in terror. Nothing was clear at all. What did that man mean? Did he seriously think she could possibly have heard any of his mysterious mouthings? But how could she say she had heard nothing but the beastly racket of the looms? How could she say she... Uh, how could she see hardly anything in the morning gloom of the huge barn-like room? The very air, a soup of dust and lint. She was simply standing there, her mouth open with no words coming out. When an arm went under around her shoulder, she shrank again, for, for the touch before she saw it was one of a young woman who tended the looms. Her head was close enough to Liddy's left ear so that Liddy could hear her say to the overseer, "'Don't worry, Mr. Mardson, uh, I'll see she settles in.' The overseer nodded, obviously relieved to not have to deal with Liddy or the loom he'd assigned her. "'We'll work together,' the girl shouted in my ear. "'My two machines are just next to you. Here, I'm Diana.' She motioned for Liddy to stand close behind her right shoulder, so although Liddy wasn't in her way as she worked, the older girl could speak into Liddy's left ear by turning her head slightly to the right. Suddenly, Diana banged a metal lever at the right at the right of the machine, and the loom shiveled to a halt. At either end of the shed, made by the crisscrossing and warp threads, was a narrow wooden trough. From the trough on the left, she retrieved the shuttle. The shuttle was wood, pointed and tipped at either end with copper. It was about the shape of a corn cob, only a little larger and hollowed out so that it could carry a bobbin of quill and weft thread. With her hands moving so quickly that Liddy could hardly follow them, Diana popped out nearly an empty quill of thread and thrust in, in a full one from a wooden box of bobbins near her feet. Then she put her mouth or she put her mouth to a small hole near one end of the shuttle and sucked out the end of the th uh, weft thread. We call it the kiss of death, she shouted, smiling wryly uh, to soften the words. She pulled out the foot or more of the thread, wound it up. Uh, quickly around one of the two iron hooks and rehung the hooks into the last row of wooden cloth. The hooks were attached by a yard or so of leather cord to a bell-shaped iron weight. You have to keep moving your temple hooks, Diana said. Pull the web down as snug as you go.
She pointed to the new inches of woven fabric. Now, Diana said, speaking into Liddy's ear, make sure the shuttle is all the way at the end of the race, always on, you're right here. She uh, placed the shuttle snug against her right hand and through the trough. We don't want any flying shuttles. All right, then. We're ready to go again. Diana grasped the metal lever, pulled it towards the loom, jammed it into the slot, and the loom shuddered once more to life. For the first hour or so, Liddy watched, trying mostly to stay out of Diana's way. As she moved al among the three machines, opposite and, and the adjoining one, the, other, or the older girl refilled the shuttles when they ran low and rehung the temple hooks to keep the web tight. Then, without warning for no reason that Liddy could see, Diana slammed off one of the looms. See, she said, pointing to the shed or pointing at the shed, a warp thread snapped. If we don't catch that, we're in trouble. An empty shuttle might damage a, uh, a few inches of goods, she explained, but a broken rat or warp could leave a flaw through yards of cloth. We don't get paid when we ruin a piece. She pinched a tiny bag and hung from the metal frame on the loom. It's er, it spit out a puff of talc, which she uh, rubbed into her fingers er, fingertips. Then, fishing out the broken ends of the warp, she showed Liddy how to fasten them together with a weaver's knot. When Diana tied the ends, they seemed to melt together, leaving a an, an, uh, knot invisible. She stepped aside. Now you start, she said. Liddy was a farm girl. She took pride in her strength, but it took all of her might to yank the metal lever into place. She broke into a sweat like some untri untried plow horse. The temples were not much larger than apples, but when Diana asked her to move one, she felt as though someone had tied a gigantic field stone to the end of the leather cord. Still, the physical strength of the work required, pal required paled, uh, besides the dexterity needed to rethread a shuttle quickly or even help her tie one of those infernal uh, weaver's knots. Everything happened too fast. A bobbin out of weft thread lasted hardly five minutes before it had to be replaced, and it was painfully deafening. But tall, quiet Diana moved from loom to loom like a silent angel in the lion's den, keeping Daniel from harm. There were moments when all three looms were running as though they ought. All the shuttles uh, bearing full quills, three temples hung high on the cloth, no warp thread snapping. During one of those respites, Diana drew Liddy to the nearest window. The sill was alive with flowers blooming in pots, and around the frame someone had pa uh, pasted single pages of books and magazines. Diana pressed down on a curling corner of a poem. Most of the sheets were yellowing. Not so much time to read these these days, Diana said. We used to have more time. Do you really like, or do you like to read, Liddy? Liddy thought of the regulations that she was still trying to laboriously to decipher when no one was looking. Not much schooling. Well, you can remedy that, the older girl said. I'll help you, if you like, some evening. Liddy looked up gratefully. She felt no need with Diana to apologize or be ashamed of her ignorance. I'm needing a bit of help with the regulations. I shouldn't wonder, but a trial for all, or they're a trial for all of us, Diana said. Why don't you bring the broadside over to number three tonight, and we'll slog through that wretched thing, wretched thing together. Amelia was not pleased that evening after supper when she realized that Liddy was ready to go out. Your first day? You ought to rest. I'm all right, Liddy said. And indeed, once the noise of the weaving room was out of her ears, she did feel quite all right. A bit tired, but certainly not over weary. I aim to do a bit of studying, she said. It made her feel proud to say such a thing. Studying? With whom? The girl I'm working with at the weaving room, Diana. She realized she didn't know Diana's surname. Amelia, Prudence, and Betsy worked in the spinning room on the third floor, so, th uh, so she supposed they did not know Diana. Betsy looked up from her ever-present novel. Diana Gross? she asked. I don't know. Just Diana. She was very kind to me today. Diana Gross, echoed Amelia. Oh, Liddy, don't be taken in. Liddy couldn't believe her ears. Eh? If it's Diana Gross, said, or Prudence said, she's known, or she's a known radical, and Amelia is concerned. Eh? Betsy laughed. I don't think our little country cousin is acquainted with any radicals, known or unknown. I know Quakers, Liddy said. Creation. They're abolitionists. Every one, eh? 
Hooray for you, Betsy, or, uh, Betsy put down her novel and made a little show, clapping her hands. Amelia was sewing a new, or new ribbons on her Sunday bonnet and watching Betsy's performance, managed to jab a needle into, the, into her finger instead of a hat brim. She stuck her finger in her mouth and looked annoyed. I wish you wouldn't keep saying things like creation in A, Liddy. It's so, so... Only the new girls from Vermont speak like that, said Prudence. Her own mountain speech was well tamed. Liddy didn't quite know what to do. She had no desire to anger her roommates, but she was quiet, set, or quite set on going to see Diana. It wasn't just the foolish regulations. She wanted to learn everything, to become as quietly competent as the tall girl. She knew enough about the factory life already to realize that good workers in the weaving room make good money. It wasn't like being a maid where... Uh, where hard work only earned you a bonus in exhaustion. Well, she said, tying her bonnet, I'll be back soon. I'd rather you wouldn't go at all, Amelia said coolly. Liddy smiled. She didn't mean to seem unfriendly or even ungrateful, though it was tiresome to always be holden to Amelia. I don't want you to worry after me. I'm going to do, I'm, I'm able to do for myself, eh? Ha! Betsy's short laugh came out like a snort. It's just, Prudence said, it's just that you haven't been here long enough to know about certain things. Amelia doesn't, well, none of us, want you to f find yourself in an awkward situation. For a moment, Liddy was afraid that Amelia, or even Prudence, would start to lecture her, so she grabbed her shawl and said, as she was moving out of the bedroom door, I'll watch out, though she was, uh, though what she was promising to look out for, she had no idea. Diana's boarding house was only two houses away from her own. The architecture was identical, a four-story brick building lined with rows and windows that blinked like sleepy eyes as lamps and candles were lit at dusk in April in an April evening. The front door was unlocked, so she walked into a large room like Miss Bellows, uh, Bedlow's, nearly filled with two large dining tables, but with the, sem the semblance of a living area on one side. And just as Miss Bedlow's parlor, chairs had been pulled away from the tables and girls were chattering and sewing and reading in the living area. It was noisy and busy as a chicken yard. Peddlers had come off the street to tempt the girls with ribbons and cheap jewelry. A local uh, phrenologist was in the corner measuring a girl's skull and preparing to read her character's uh, from his findings. Several girls were watching this cons consultation transfixed. Liddy pushed the door shut and stood just inside, uncertain how to proceed. How could she ask Di for Diana when she wasn't even sure what her proper name was? But she didn't, or she needn't had worried. Out of the chattering mess, mass of bodies, Diana rose from a chair in the corner and came to where Liddy stood. Her smile, or she smiled, her and her long, serious face creased into dimples. I'm so glad you came. Let's go upstairs where we can speak about something in less than a shout. What a relief it was to climb the stairs and leave the most of the racket of uh, racket two floors behind. There was no one else in Diana's room. What a treat, Diana said, as though reading Liddy's mind. Sometimes I'd sell my soul for a moment of quiet, wouldn't you? Liddy nodded. She suddenly felt shy around Diana, who seemed even more imposing away from the looms when her lovely, elegant voice was pitched right and low, like the call of a morning dove. First, we need to get properly introduced, she said. I'm Diana Gross. Um... She must have noticed the flicker of something in Liddy's face because she had um, she had added the infamous Diana Goss and, uh, and dimpled into her lovely smile. Liddy reddened. So you've been warned. Not really. Well then, you'll be fine. I'm a friend of Sarah Bagley's. She watched Liddy's face for a reaction to the name and when she got none, tried another. Amelia Sargent? Mary Emerson? Hoodless Stone? No? Well, you'll hear some of those names soon enough. Our crime has been to speak out for better working conditions. She looked at Liddy again. Yes, then, or yes, why then, should operatives themselves fear us? It is, dear Liddy, the nature of slavery to make the slave fear freedom. I'm not a slave, Liddy said more free, or fiercely than she intended. You're not here for a lecture. I'm sorry. Tell me about yourself. It was hard for Liddy to talk about herself. She had no practice. With Amelia and Prudence and Betsy, she didn't need to. They, especially Amelia, always seemed to be telling about herself or trying to make her uh, like themselves. Besides, what was interesting about her? What would someone like Diana want to know? 
there's Charlie, she began, and before she knew it, she was explaining that she was here to earn money to pay off her father's debts so that she and Charlie could go home. Diana did not smile, ironically, or laugh, as Betsy was sure to. She did not only or she did not once lecture her as though she were a slow child the way Amelia often did, or offer a single explanation as Prudence would have felt obliged to. No, the tall girl perched on the ledge of the bed listened silently and intently until Liddy had run out of the story to tell. Liddy was a bit breathless, never having said so many words in the space of so few minutes in her life, and then embarrassed she had to talk so long about herself. She asked, "'But I reckon you know how it is with families, eh?' "'Not really. I can hardly remember mine. Only my aunt that kept me until I was ten, and now she's gone.' Liddy made, us, uh, Liddy made as if to sympathize, um, but Diana shook it off. I think the mill I think of the mill as my family. I it gives me plenty of sisters to worry about, but she said, I don't think I need to worry about you. You don't know what it is to not work hard, do you? I don't mind work. The noise like Diana laughed, yes, the noise is terrible at the beginning, but you get accustomed to it somehow. Liddy found it hard to believe, but if Diana said so, and I don't suppose you think a thirteen hour day overly long either. Liddy's eyes had never been or Liddy's days had never been run on clocks. I just work until the work is done, she said, but I never had to leave uh, to go call or paying calls in the evening before. And the wages seem fair? I ain't been paid yet, from what I hear. What did you get at the inn? I don't know, 50 cents a week, I think. They sent it to my mama. Trifinia said the mistress was, or was, was like to forget as not. I suppose Charlie, Liddy stopped speaking. Neither Charlie or her mother knew where she was. Is something the matter, Liddy? I haven't wrote to them. Charlie nor my mother. They don't know where I am. Suppose they needed her. How would they find her? Liddy felt a panic rising. She cut off from all of them. She might as well have gone to the other side of the world. She was out of their reach. When will they pay me? If it's the paper you need. It's the postage, too. I'd have to prepay. They don't have the money uh, to pay at the end. I could manage postage. I can't borrow. I've borrowed too much already. But Diana quietly insisted. Liddy... Uh, owed it to her family to let them know right away, she said. She brought out a paper, pen, and ink, and a sturdy board for Liddy to write upon. Liddy would have felt shy about forming letters so laboriously in front of Diana, but Diana took a book and made Liddy feel as if she were alone. Dear Mother, you will be surprised to know I am gone to Lowell to work. I am weaving. I am in the weaving room at Concord Corp. I board at number five. If you write me, even one or every one is kind and the food is plenty and tasty. I am saving my money to pay the debts. I am well. I trust you and the babies are well too. Your faithful daughter, Lydia Worthen. It seemed extravagant to take another sheet to write to Charlie, but Diana had said that she ought to write to him as well. Dear brother, do not be surprised. I have gone to Lowell for a factory girl. Everyone is kind. The work is all right. The machines are noisy. Believe me. The money is good. I will save and pay off the debts so we can still hop. Ha ha. Your loving sister, Lydia Worthen. P.S. I'm at Concord Corp. Number 5, if you can write. Excuse all the mistakes. I, I'm in a great hurry. She folded the letters and sealed them with Diana's wax and addressed them. Before she could ask further about posting them, Diana took the letters in her hand. I have to go tomorrow, anyhow. Let me mail them for you. I will pay you back as soon as I get paid, she sighed. As soon as I pay Trifinia. No, Diana said. This time it's my welcoming gift. You mustn't try to repay a gift. The bell rang for curfew. We haven't looked at the silly regulations, Diana said. Well, another time. Diana walked to number five. It was bright and cool night, uh, through in the, or though in the city the stars had seemed dim and far away. Until tomorrow, Diana said at the door. I'm obliged to you for everything, Liddy said. Uh, Diana shook her head. They need to, or they need to know. They'll worry. The roommates were already getting into bed. You're late, Amelia said. I come as soon as the bell rung. Oh, you're not really, uh, you're not really late, said Betsy. Amelia just doesn't approve of where you've been. It was Diana Goss, wasn't it? Amelia said. Yes. And Liddy was taking off her bonnet and her shawl. And what? 
And what did Amelia mean? Amelia answered her own question. Did she try to make you join? Liddy folded her shawl, still uncomprehending. She means, Betsy said, did she tie you up and torture you until you promised to join the Female Labor Reform Association? Oh, Betsy, said Prudence. She never mentioned such, Liddy said. She made her way around Amelia and Prudence's beds and the trunks to the side of the bed that she shared with Betsy. She sat on the edge of the bed and began to take off her shoes and stockings. Then what were you doing all that time? Betsy slammed the book shut. What affair is it of yours, Amelia? It's all right, Liddy said. She had no desire to get her roommates stirring up over nothing. She gave me paper to write to my family to tell them I was here. Oh, Liddy, Prudence said. How thoughtless of us. We never offered. No matter, Liddy said. It's done, or I done it now. She's devious, Amelia muttered. You have to watch her. Believe me, Liddy, I'm only thinking of your own good. Betsy snorted and reached over and blew out the candle as the final curfew bell began to clang.